So my name is Emily Long, and I am with an organization that's based in New York called The LAMP, which stands for the Learning About Multimedia Project. We are not just named after a household appliance, um, as is sometimes commonly thought. Um, and I just, I, before I get started, I just want to say, Portland is such a happy little place. Um, I, yesterday I was out for a run, and I saw these two um, kids on a skateboard totally cut someone off on the sidewalk, and the guy was just like, mm. in New York, that's like a smack across the face, or at least like a call down the street. So I just want to really first just say, I'm like super impressed with everybody's patience here, and the food is so good, and you love your airport carpet, and it's amazing. So yeah, so just round of applause to Portland. It's my first time here, so thank you guys all for, uh, for, for having me. Um, <laughs> all right, so as I said, um, I'm with an organization called The Lamp, and we are a nonprofit organization, and what we do is we focus on teaching young people how to be critical thinkers. Um, and not just thinkers, but also makers, um, and particularly focused on media. So what we want is a world of active and critical media participants, and this doesn't just mean that like, by active, we don't mean that you're just constantly on Twitter, you're constantly on Instagram or Snapchat or whatever, blah, blah, blah. What we mean is that we want you to be actually thoughtful about what's coming at you from the other side, what it is that you're, that you're creating. Um, and we often speak of this like being um, 10,000 little John Stewart's, or I guess we'll have to change that, I suppose, um, <laughs> in, in August somehow, maybe. Um, uh, but the point of it is just that, you know, we see Jon Stewart as an example of someone who is able to talk back to media, create in response to media, take on the establishment, um, and just ask some really critical, kind of tough questions that we think kind of, you know, can get at, like, who's making the message, why is it being made, what is the purpose behind it, and just calling attention to those elements of, of media that, uh, that we think are, are really important. Um, so here is an example of, um, an, this is from an event that we did back in January called Break the Super Bowl. And um, I'll come back and talk more about that a little bit later, but just wanted to show you a picture of just some of the kids that we work with. We work with between 600 and 700 kids every year directly um, in New York City. This is, you know, 15 of them. Um, but before, um, you know, I go into the rest of my presentation, one of the things that we want to take a look at is just um, what kids like this are doing online and with media, what kind of media they're taking and how much time. So this is a big study that came out of the Pew Research Center um, fairly recently. And this shows frequency of time online. So as you can see here, there's about a quarter of teens um, who were in this survey who say that they're online almost constantly. Um, and then another 56% who say that they're on several times a day. Um, so, you know, by the time you work all those numbers out, you've got a day, people are, uh, teens going online daily, 92% uh, of teens are online every day, which is probably not really all that surprising to us. What surprised me more was um, actually that there weren't more teens who were saying that they're online almost constantly. Because when you think about smartphones, really most of us are online constantly. Um, a lot of people don't even turn off their phones at night. So you're technically online while you're sleeping if you're reachable. Um, but this is partially due to the proliferation of things like smartphones, but also of tablets, which are really expanding access to um, a lot of teens that previously you know, might not have had access to a desktop computer, um, broadband access is getting better, all of these things are, are, are improving. So you've got more people consuming more media, more teens consuming more media on a more regular basis. But of course, all this tells us really is just frequency. This doesn't really tell us um, just how much they're taking in. And for that, we gotta go back in time a little bit to 2010. So this is media exposure. 8 to 18 year olds, um, broken down by race, gender, and parents' education. And the reason why parents' education matters is because that typically correlates to um, income. The more education you have, the more money you make, 
generally. So, and this, when we talk about media, and when I talk about media here in this presentation, what I'm really talking about are pretty much everything. Television, music, movies, online video, advertisements, magazines, books, anything that is any kind of a message that you are, that you are taking in. In addition to all of this, you're also, the average American gets around 3,000 advertising messages a day. So some of that has worked into, into these numbers because obviously it pops up in the video and movies and stuff that they're getting, but then some of it doesn't. Um, but one thing here that I really want to point out is the spike in media use from whites to black and Hispanics and parent education. Um, so you can see here, uh, if you are, um, if you're black, you're getting up to about 13, or Hispanic, you're getting up to 13 hours of media use per day. That factors in um, multitasking as well. Um, and then gender, um, not such a big gap. That's about, an, boys get a little bit more than girls. And then, um, as you can see for age, fortunately our eight to 10 year olds are getting only about eight hours a day. And then it goes up from there. Um, and I'm gonna come back to our, to our kids again, but just these are, the, these are the kids that the LAMP is mostly trying to reach. We're trying to reach the underserved kids, um, which again, generally are, are minorities and ones who are in the lower socioeconomic strata. Um, but let's take a second here and look at who typically makes all of this media that our kids are taking in. And it's mostly these guys, ultimately. <laughs> These are um, seven men who control about 90% of the media that we take in. Um, they own the largest media um, conglomerates in the world. And everything ultimately stops at then. Um, and it begs the question about how democratic media really are when it ultimately boils down to the voice of just seven white older men. Um, it's also worth noting here, not pictured is um, Sumner Redstone, who is the chairman of both Viacom and CBS. Um, and then also because, um, I know it threw me when I first saw it, I Heart Media, Robert Pittman, the second guy in the top row, um, that used to be clear channel communication. So that hopefully clears that up a little bit. Um, CBS owns, obviously, anything starting with CBS. They also own Showtime, Smithsonian, Simon & Schuster. Comcast is the big NBC juggernaut, which also owns Bravo, Fandango, iVillage, Telemundo, Universal Pictures, Focus Features, Universal Parks. Disney, of course, owns everything Disney, which includes cruise lines and theme parks, um, Disney Interactive, Disney Radio, as well as ABC, ESPN, Marvel Studios, Pixar, Touchstone. News Corps is the New York Post, HarperCollins, Dow Jones, Amplify, which is a gigantic educational technology company, if you're not familiar with them. Obviously Fox, Wall Street Journal, Time Warner, is Warner Brothers, HBO, CNN, Turner, TNT, TBS, TCM, Viacom, MTV, Comedy Central, BET, VH1, Nickelodeon, Spike, TV Land, Paramount. So these are all of the biggest companies that I mean, you can already see how this, somewhere along the line, what you're seeing every day really comes back to these guys who, um, you know, as they say, I guess, the buck stops with them. Um, and that's something that's important. But of course, they're not all, you know, these guys are not on hands-on with absolutely every little thing that passes. So the question then becomes, so where's everybody else? If I can get to the next one. There we go. Um, and that group of CEOs is typically when, what people mean when they talk about the media or the mainstream media. We're typically talking about their companies, but um, there are, of course, other people that work with them and for them. Um, so here's one. Of the top 120 top grossing films from 2010 to 2013, women represented 30.9% of all speaking or named characters. In top 100 films for 2013, 10.8% of speaking characters were black, 5% were Asian, 4.2% were Hispanic. So as far as the people who are appearing in their work, there's not really a whole lot of diversity there. 
In 2014, 10 states had less than 10 women take the AP Computing Science exam. 10 states. 13 states had no black students take the exam. And that's actually an increase from 11 in 2013. Seven states had zero Hispanic students take the exam, eight in 2013. So it's a slight move downward. In 2014, 11% of the information technology leaders at American-based tech firms were women. And that's actually an improvement from the global average, which is 7%. In 2014, minorities made up just 13% of the total newsroom staff. Women made up 37.2, which is obviously, you know, looking pretty good when you compare it to some of the other numbers. But the point here is just that, so while we have these, you know, six um, white older men who run these large companies, even when you look at the people who are working under them, who work with them, who actually execute on their visions every single day, there's not really a whole lot of diversity there. And the problem with that is that then the types of messages that we're getting and the narratives that we get are extremely limited. Um, you can be, uh, uh, this is, I love men, I'm married to a very nice one. Um, I obviously myself am white, but one of the things that's important here for, for all of us, and I'll talk about this more again in the panel that um, I'm also speaking on at 1015 about women in tech, is that our, one of the important things to remember is that our experiences are limited. I have never been anything other than a white woman moving through this world. I do not understand, cannot understand what it's like to be a person of color, or a transgender person, or a man. And so the stories that I can tell sincerely and truly and well are, are limited to my experience. And in order for us to tell stories and um, send out messages that are representative of a larger group of people, it's really important that we bring more diversity into the people who are producing the messages. So otherwise you get one story and that's it. And that's, that's not really a fun way to move to move through the world, and it's also not really a way to, um, we think, foster critical thinking if um, you're really only looking at, at one type of message. Um, and so it's important to know who these people are who create these messages, because they are gatekeepers. And they do, they do wield their power, um, as, we can, as we can see here. So the video that I was going to show actually is one that some of you may have seen before. It's, um, it's called Dove Evolution. And it is the one that shows the woman. She sits down. She's very normal, plain looking, maybe like, you know, just woke up out of bed. And she sits down in front of the camera and they do her makeup and her hair and everything and they make her look amazing and completely different. And the point is they're showing you how, um, just how much power and control media have over changing the way that we look and then what effect that has on, um, on other uh, young children um, and who may not understand exactly the powers of Photoshop. And when we show that video to our students, they are incredible, you know, at least when we first showed it to them years and years ago, when we first got started as an organization in 2007, they were kind of blown away. You know, they knew that Photoshop could change a lot of things, but they didn't understand that it could change just that much. And then we showed them um, a commercial by Axe, which was of um, you know, supposedly billions of bikini-clad women all running towards a man who's wearing Axe body spray, and they are in love with him because he's wearing Axe body spray, and that's the end of it. And what really um, blew them away was when we told them that these messages were made by the same people. Uh, Unilever owns both Axe and Dove, and the students that we'd explain this to who clearly felt, you know, watching the Dove video, like, oh, wow, you know, Dove understands this. They get what it's like to be us and just how challenging and how hard this can be. And then to find out that they're still then working the other side of the equation that actually is contributing to them kind of feeling so crappy and, like, you know, we are ultimately expected to be these bikini babes um, who are just completely focused on getting a man. Um, and even more than that, then when you look at the actual numbers that come out of the Dove Real Beauty campaign, they're not doing it out of the goodness of their heart, which is one of the tricky things of their, of their marketing that they're trying to do. Um, 
the Dove's um, revenues since doing the Real Beauty campaign have gone up $10 billion. There's nothing altruistic about it. They're still creating a construction. They're still trying to sell you something. They're not just out there to say that you're beautiful the way that you are. There's still something behind it. Um, and so, do we, can I, I still don't have my computer back. There we go, okay. Um, so one of the things that happens then is we teach all of this to our kids or we talk about it with other people and they're like, so you want people to stop using media? And we're like, no. That's not the point. The point is that we want you to use it better. We want you to make it better. We want you to demand better. We think of ourselves as media critics, and just as a food critic is not telling you not to eat, they're trying to help you to do it better. And that's really the point. Um, when we come back here, for example, calorie counts. When you come back here and you look at um, how many calories are in a particular sandwich, the point is nobody's saying don't ever eat the chipotle chicken on toasted French with bacon because it's got most of the calories that you might need over the course of a day. What they're saying is just be aware. I have two sisters who are both marathon runners. They can eat that. That's great for them. I run three miles and I think I'm amazing, but that doesn't mean that I can go out and have that for lunch every day because that's just not gonna be right for me. So that's what, the, that's what the calorie counts are there to try and, tell, and help you to do, and they'll help you to be better and be more aware of what you're doing and what you're taking into your body. Um, and we really think that that's the same thing should be there for, for media. You should be aware of who's making the messages, and you should be aware of why they're making them, who they're making them for, and what kind of impact they're trying to have on you. Um, and at the LAMP, we want this to go even further than just knowing. We want it to go actually into production. We want them to actively respond to media, like these guys. These are just a small handful of some of the most brilliant satirists and um, parody artists and writers that we have seen in our age, and their function is vital to society and to our culture. They are creating a space where you can talk back to power, where you can challenge ideas, where you can, in, in, in a fairly safe space, particularly here, in the United States where free speech is a constitutional right. This is, a, this is the place to do that. Whether you call it um, remix or culture jamming or hacking or stealing or whatever, it is a vitally important social purpose. It's not just a fun thing to do. It's not something that just gets laughs. And it's been going on for hundreds of years it will continue to go on for hundreds of years, and we want our students to be part of that movement. We want everyone to be part of that movement, where you're not just passively taking in information like a sponge, but you're actually talking back to it and being critical of it and talking back to hypocrisy, challenging established normative behavior in a way that is positive and nonviolent and creative. And one of the ways that we try and do this is through this tool that we at The Lamp have been developing called the Media Breaker. We launched this back in October 2013. We built the prototype for it with a grant from the Knight Foundation. And what it is, it's an online cloud-sourced video remix platform um, where students can take third-party copyrighted media drop it into the editor, and then they can remix it with critical statements, insert other media, insert voiceovers, um, and deconstruct the media, use the media itself to talk back to the media. And we've been using it in our workshops, not only in New York, excuse me, but other educators and organizations have been using it elsewhere across the country, in places like Austin, Miami, Boston, Chicago, Los Angeles. And if we can get this to play, here's an example. How many times people have said, oh, I don't watch the game, I just watch the commercial? What if we try to create an event around the biggest day for commercials of the year? The Super Bowl. But instead, we had the breaking of the commercials sort of the centerpiece. So Break the Super Bowl, as it stands now, is a Super Bowl party like you've seen. We've got pizza, we've got soda chips, cookies, everything that you expect to see at a Super Bowl party. You have the game being played up on the wall. But the thing that's very different is that we have laptops loaded with all the commercials that they're going to be showing during the Super Bowl. 
and then the students themselves spend time watching the, the ads in advance and pick which ones they want to re-edit. And then they re-edit them, we review them to make sure that they adhere to fair use, which is using, being able to use copyrighted material in a critical way. And then once that gets approved, we push them up to YouTube so that they're live while the actual commercial is playing during the game. So the idea is that if someone sees that Doritos commercial during the Super Bowl, they'll be like, oh, I gotta see that, that commercial again. And they'll go to YouTube, and there will our critique be right at the top. And that's actually gotten us a lot of traffic as a result of it, and we've gotten a lot of really great interaction with people who normally would never even think critically about of commercials. I am the team coordinator here at the McBurney YMCA. And right now, um, our teams are uh, breaking um, a couple commercials. This is our second time um, working with Lamp. Something that uh, Lamp does really, really well um, that I that we really, really like um, is that they really kind of talk about um, using like this the digital media platform as a um, as a tool to voice like dissent, um, which is really, really rare. But when they get to college in that second tier of education, it's more about critical thinking and picking things apart, and not so much accepting what is is like shown to you at first, you know, first glimpse. I actually found it challenging because um, I at one point I got stuck and I didn't know what to think of. So it kind of like it forced me to think further, um, and think more deeply into the about the, the advertisements. Breaking the commercials down it was pretty fun. It taught me like the basics of like editing somewhat, and uh, I enjoyed it. You know, our mission is to help people comprehend media, how to create media and ultimately how to critique media and this is all encompassed in this one event. We're looking at actually getting funding to expand it into a series, what we're calling Breakathon. So we want to replicate this into what we're calling a toolkit that hopefully we can export out to other cities and other organizations that want to do this. We worked with the YMCA in New York, um, and we brought all those 15 kids that I showed you before. We got them to a party, we ordered wings, we ordered pizza, we had the game projected live on a wall, and then we, they took actual Super Bowl commercials, and they remixed them in real time while the game was happening. Talking back, this one um, student created a video that um, I, I don't think will play, um, that was called uh, the Super Bowl Sexist Medley. And it uh, put together all of the, you know various Super Bowl commercials, and remixed them and talking back to some of the sexist messages that were in them. Because obviously, while you've got there's some positive messages that are starting to come out. You've got advertisers like GoDaddy that are you know now stopping being so horribly misogynistic in their efforts to try and get you to use their service to buy a, don a domain name. But then you've still got people like Carl's Jr who are making these just really awful hamburger commercials that there's no reason why anybody, it's a hamburger. You shouldn't need to go that far to sell a hamburger. And we understand that advertisements um, serve a purpose and they send a message, but we just think that there's a, a, a smarter way to do it. We don't think it's necessary to make people feel really crummy about, about themselves or to try and, and denigrate or take down um, you know, an individual's sense of self-esteem or a group's sense of self-worth just for the purpose of selling meat between bread. Um, and these are the things that we're trying to get them to challenge. And again, it's not about not enjoying it. Our kids still enjoyed watching the Super Bowl commercials. But what we were trying to do, and what the LAMP is trying to do in general, is get them to say, okay, while you're watching this and enjoying it, just be aware of everything else that's happening. Just because you criticize something doesn't mean you don't love it or you can't love it. It just means that you see it for what it is. You can take it in and move on, but hopefully you're not gonna absorb it as, as gospel and you're not gonna you know, let it guide the way that you treat yourself and treat other people. Um, actually, go back here. Um, and one of the things that I'm really happy to report is that this movement um, that we're trying to build for critical thinking and through Remix is really catching on. Um, just this past year, in addition to our own Break the Super Bowl event, there was a professor at the University of Southern California who ran an event that she called um, Rip the Red Carpet, 
where kids took on um, movie trailers and they spoke back to messages in, in Hollywood and they you know, made mashups that questioned things like, okay, so boyhood takes place in Texas, where are the Hispanics? Um, or you know, why is there only one, generally one woman um, action hero in every action movie? Um, asking questions like that. Um, and The Lamp, um, we recently won funding to expand these events, like the one that we're doing in August, um, the MTV Video Music Awards. We're doing a series of breaking on that, working with, again, the YMCA, but also with YouTube Studios in uh, the Chelsea market. And in addition to that, we also recently got funding um, to develop a whole learning platform around the Media Breaker, which will allow students um, and educators to set up what, what we're calling for right now anyway, learning pathways or like virtual classrooms where they can input their input media that might be focused on a certain theme. So maybe media about the environment that kids will talk back to or um, media that focuses on stereotypes. And they can then remix this in a closed environment and share that work with their teachers um, and their classmates, and they can earn badges based on um, different achievements that they make. Sorry. And so this sort of thing is, like I said, it's just really starting to catch fire and, and pick on and move up. Um, and one thing that I would be remiss without mentioning is, of course, we get a lot of people asking, how is this possibly all legal? And the way that it's legal is through fair use. Um, which allows for the reuse of third-party media if the purpose is educational. Um, and so far, we have um, uh, gotten, I think, six or seven different takedown notices for our videos that have gone up on YouTube, and all but one of them have been reinstated. So we're doing pretty well. All of our videos that we submit, that our students submit, they all have to go through a legal process. Um, we have educational resources that are up to try and, and help people better understand fair use so that the videos that they're making um, are within fair use guidelines. And we think that that's really part of the educational process. When everybody is a maker and everybody is building off of somebody else's work, it's really important to know when you're just flat out stealing and pirating versus when you're reusing and improving and innovating on top of something else. Um, and in the case of the learning environment that we're creating, all of the videos are gonna be kept private within the learning environment by default. Um, of course, there will be an option to submit them for full publication if people want to, but the reason for this is that fair use can get pretty confusing, and it's tough to get right on the first try. And so we want students to be able to tinker and make mistakes and create in a safe space, um, but not necessarily share it out with the larger world if they want to. So what's our end game with all of this? Because that's another thing that we hear a lot about um, is you know, what is this type of world that you're trying to create? And one answer that we have is McDonald's. So um, McDonald's, as everybody in this room is aware, I'm sure, didn't used to offer things like milk and apples with their Happy Meals. And what happened is you have a lot of parents and a lot of other people at McDonald's who then came and talked back and ask why that has to be the case, why it's got to be that Happy Meals have only got fried chicken and burgers and fries in them. And enough people spoke up and made a demand that McDonald's had to change. Not because it was necessarily the right thing to do, but because it affected their bottom line. And that's a similar thing that we're trying to do. We think that when people demand change, when they ask for more accountable and transparent and responsible media messaging, um, the mass media producers will have to change because it will affect their bottom line. Again, not because it's the right thing to do. We don't think there's anything altruistic about it. Um, and again, just showing what happens when, um, as an example of what happens when you get more diversity in the people who are producing content um, is this quote by Tina Fey that came out um, in an interview with Glamour earlier this year when uh, SNL was doing its various 40-year anniversaries um, and her comment, you're not gonna stay up all night to give yourself one wife line. Um, this is how SNL has become such a breeding ground for female comedians because everybody comes in and they write for themselves. 
So they have a more diverse writing room than most late night television. Um, and as a result, you get people who can stretch and you get more characters and you get more stories. Um, and that's what happens when you get more people in the content and producing room. And that's one of the things that we're trying to do, again, by empowering kids to make, to criticize, to talk back. We think we're getting, you know, we're hopefully in future years going to get more people actually in the rooms producing and creating and more stories will be told and more perspectives will be told and more opportunities will be born out of that. Um, and, you know, here are some other uh, pictures from some of our other workshops. We want our students to be engaging better and learning better and working better. We want them to be part of the larger media conversation and just bust up this one-way flow um, of media. And that's, you know, really what we're, what we're after, what we're trying to do. Again, not trying to get anybody to hate media. I have my own guilty pleasure TV shows that I watch. Um, and that's fine, but it's just about being critical of it. Um, so with that, I guess, do we have time for... Uh, Questions? Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Um, so the question is if we'd be concerned if big media ever took what we said to heart and harnessed it in a non-altruistic way? So showing more perspective out of bad motivation? Um, I'm not really sure, I guess I'm not, I'm trying to imagine what that would look like, what showing more perspective out of a bad motivation would be like. Um, I mean, I think what we, what, what we really want is for more perspectives to be shown and, and the idea being that that is pretty tough to do in an insincere way. Um, I mean, you've seen like on Comedy Central, like Amy Schumer's show coming out, um, and she's, kind of having a moment right now. Um, it's hard for me to tell, but, I'd, but I don't think that she's doing anything that really is insincere or not organic to what she's trying to say about um, uh, commenting on the female experience or on being a woman in our culture, the way that our culture regards women and women in sex. Um, so I guess, yeah, I mean, we, we certainly would be concerned if it happened. I'm just, I'm trying to imagine what that looks like. And I'm sure that it does look like something, and I just, my brain is too small. <laughs> um, yeah? Um, the critical side of it definitely needs to be taught. One of the side effects um, that we've been seeing, and again, this is all anecdotal, of kids having internet in their pockets and carrying around little computers with them everywhere they go, is they get a little apathetic about media, and it's such a huge force that it can be hard for them to understand how they can possibly make a difference, how they can change it, and there's this sense of like, well, that's just the way it is. Um, and the belief in any one person's ability to actually make change and influence it um, is, is harder. And with that apathy comes, you know, I think, out of definition, a kind of laziness. And so we need to teach them that it's still important to be critical and that it's still possible to be critical um, and still be a member of a mediated environment, which we all are. So... That's what I think is the important thing, is just to teach them to keep asking questions, and that it's still worthwhile to keep asking questions. Anyone else? What's your YouTube channel? Oh, yeah, our YouTube channel. Um, it's youtube.com backslash the lamp. Those are our student videos, and then um, youtube.com backslash the media breaker is all of the broken remixed videos. Like, 
how to innovate storytelling so that the messages maybe are told in a way that isn't so, I don't know, like sexist and or misogynistic or whatever. Like, is there some sort of innovation in storytelling and or advertising messaging that comes along with it? Well, that's what we think we're trying to do with the remix, is we're trying to get them to re-harness those narratives and flip them around and tell them in new ways. Um, so that's the way that we're trying to do that. We are, I mean, one thing that's important that sets us apart from a lot of other organizations is that we're not like a teen filmmaking organization. This is not a place where students come and they're gonna make a very slick, polished documentary about their own experiences. That's totally important, that's just not what we do. Um, we're, our focus is on process, not product, and on, and on critical thinking. So um, we do have a lot of students that come in and they, they learn with us and they decide that they wanna take it further, and that's great. We try and provide them pathways so that they can do that with other organizations. But we're not, we're not as we say, um, you know, we're trying to build the next generation of junior John Stewart's, not of Martin Scorsese's or Steve Jobs. Does that answer? Do you think given the demographic that you're actually targeting people who are minorities, we're already skeptical because we know what our position is based on our statistics? I'm sorry, I missed the last part. We already know what our position is based on our t statistics of being in a lower demographic in technology, so don't you think maybe we are a little bit more skeptical of media? Um, it's not what we've been finding. Um, we've been finding, again, just this sense of apathy and powerlessness um, that doesn't necessarily come with skepticism, although I, I think we all wish that it would. Um, there are some, some amazingly depressing stats that are out there about, for example, how heavily um, fast food companies and um, beverage companies target to black and Hispanic teens. Um, and when we, you know, if we show them those numbers as part of a workshop, they're blown away. They're actually surprised. So it's not something that we think that there is obvious to them because it's just, it's part of their world. It's just, it's, it's part of the bubble that they live in, so that's what they know and that's what they see and that's what becomes normalized. So, um, yeah, I would say, I would say no. And I'm wondering if there are any efforts out there to take it into like the public schools or something where you could get this kind of critical thinking and with respect to media to a broader audience? Because obviously as a nonprofit, you can only take on so many people per year. Right, so we do work in public, in public schools um, in New York City and that's part of what we're trying to do with the Media Breakers, have a free tool that teachers can use in public schools all across the country. And with the learning platform that we're developing, there's a lot of other resources and things that are coming along with that that will really make it easier for teachers to bring this into their classrooms. I mean, we've already started to see that happen in some other schools. So, I mean, again, like you said, we as an organization can only, we're one organization, we can only do so much. And we, right now, we don't have any plans to open offices, for example, example here in Portland, although we would love to. There are other media, organ media literacy organizations elsewhere around the, the country that are doing fantastic work. Um, but, you know, we ourselves are focused in New York and we're trying to make tools that can help to expand that message. Groups and what would what would your recommendations be on this type of project for that demographic that like not only it's not represented negatively but like is almost invisible in the media that's interesting because we were talking about um we were kind of talking in some of our staff meetings um and with some of our other facilitators last summer when um there was kind of a resurgence in the um issue about the redskins and their naming um I think that's one area where Native Americans, I think, could really have a huge impact because it's something that already has kind of a high visibility level. Um, but you're, I mean, you're right that there are, are in some ways a, a kind of invisible group. They're not very well represented in media at all. Um, but I would say just start with challenging the popular stereotypes and really take those, take those messages on. Um, whether it's through something like Remix, like we're doing, or just mobilizing more around around media and helping to raise awareness about um, how damaging those stereotypes can be, because obviously there's this counter-narrative that comes out about 
you know, that Native Americans don't really care that the Redskins are the Redskins. I went to my, for college, I went to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and until fairly recently, we were the fighting Illini. So um, I feel very close, I guess, to that message, because while I was there, that was constantly raging, and there was uh, no right or wrong side for that. So it's a, it's a, it's a tough issue. Um, but yeah, I think, it's a, I think it's a really, really important one, though, to wage. Hi. As part of your curriculum and learning environment, is it also your goal to make it entrepreneurial so that you move from consuming to creating and producing also? Yeah, that's, again, that's part of what we're trying to do with the remix part, is to get students to produce and create. Um, and in addition to the remix, and I didn't talk about that as much, but we believe that the best way for students to understand how media is made and to get and to be critical of it is by making their own. So we do have in our program, students do make their own documentaries and their own commercials and their own news videos and broadcasts and other reports and things like that. Again, the focus is on process, not product. So our students are not spending hours and hours perfecting transitions. It's more about nailing down what the storytelling elements are and messing around with, with those to see, okay, so how does the story change if I put this first or if I put this second? Playing around with storyboarding um, and the and the telling and the telling of that, but it's all for the critical thinking purpose. It's not about the artistic endeavor side of it. Um, and again, you know, we have some students who come into our workshops and they really fall in love with it, and they decide that they want to go off and do editing, and that's that's their goal. Um, and again, that's great, and we try and provide pathways for them to do that. But we do want them to be independent and uh, independent producers, and we're trying to give them the tools so that they can so that they can do that and uh, share their ideas and their voices. How much more time we have left? One more question? Okay. All right, okay. All right, well, thank you guys all um, for coming and for having me.